Sean O'Brien's book is called The Beautiful Librarians, and it celebrates things like adult learning, libraries, solidarity, collectivism. One of the lines in the book says, though you bury stuff forever, it keeps on coming back. And it makes me think of my librarian, Mrs. Dove, who once took me on one side and gave me a book by Henry Ryder Haggard and said, I think you're nearly ready for this. And that was a, a wonderful moment in my writing development. But also, Sean warns, as he says, must this be the trap of elegy to find ourselves composed entirely of literature? And we mustn't fall into that trap, and Sean doesn't in this book. And what is wonderful about this book for me is that it's defiantly northern. It looks at these interminable train journeys on cross-country trains, or as we call them, cross-country regrets. And writing courses, northeast pubs, the kind of places that are the very stuff of life and the stuff of poetry. Although I must say, in one of the poems, he meets a, wobbly, a wobbling suitor with a grease-grey quiff. And I hope that's not me. Sure. Uh, well, ladies and gentlemen, having heard the extraordinary readings this evening, my my true response is, kill me now. But uh, uh, Some years ago, I began to go deaf, as was pointed out to me by my nearest and dearest, especially in the car. So I, I acquired uh, hearing aids, but I discovered I could hear absolutely everything, which became intolerable. And I could also hear things that hadn't happened. And at one point, I was doing a reading with my friend and colleague, Mr. Patterson, where I began to pick up Radio Luxembourg, <laughs> even though they'd ceased broadcasting a decade before. And I decided it was better to be deaf. So if I ask you to repeat yourself, please bear with me. Audiology. I hear an elevator sweating in New Orleans, water folding black on black in tanks deep under Carthage, unfracked oil in Lancashire and what you're thinking. It's the truth. There goes your silent count to ten, the held breath of forbearance, all the language not yet spoken or unspeakable, the dark side of the page. But this is not about you. I can hear the sea drawn back from Honshu, hookers in the holding pen and loggeria in the dreaded quiet coach, the firestorm of random signs on market indices, the bull, the bear, the sound of one hand clapping and the failure of the reins, the crackle of the dried out stars, stars being born, anomalies and either or, the soundtrack of creation in an unrecorded vowel, the latest that might be the last, the leading edge of all that is the case or is not there. The contradictions cover such a range. And I'm told that soon it will be easier to balance out the love cry and the howl, to wear an aid and act my age, to hear the world behind this world, and not to crave amnesia. Uh, Ian mentioned a poem about a pub. After extensive research, I can confirm that the Rams Hill Hotel Scarborough is the worst pub in the world. <laughs> and the fact that uh, we have recently inherited a flat there from my late mother has enabled me to study this phenomenon more closely. <laughs> and whatever doubts I had have now been entirely removed. And as they say at workshops with the poem you're about to um, 
dismantle in a sympathetic way, but this is actually true. This is old lads at the Rams Hill Hotel. The old lads left for dead once more arise through the Velcroed floor of the family lounge to take their positively final leaves of the hard-faced ladies whose husbands they ignore. Dancing again like good little navy-trained bantamweights, the old lads are invoking a higher authority. Leave him, Stan, leave him. By means of Spanish eyes, Delilah never can say goodbye. And they can't, for this is the eternity of love that opens the old lads' mouths like buckets to the skies. Ferocious and backcombed, the cackling ladies are all too aware of this game. You're a good turn, pet, but you're on too long. Yet even their iron-clad hearts, those cold and lonely, lovely works of art, are still melted half a degree by these wobbly suitors with grease-gray quiffs and suits which are older than they are, by gentlemen willing, more willing than Barkis, to take them away from all this as might an oriental potentate to the scarlet delights of the Yashmak Seraglio or, to be practical, the car park. <laughs> and when a gentleman, not like you, eh, Stan? A gentleman is crooning, the shadow of your smile uh, when you are gone will give us mucky dreams and light the dawn. Crooning while perched on the glowing red tip of a last cigarette taken uninvited from a husband's open packet, crooning an angel of fagash and old breath and pea stains. What lady can resist such old school, old world, underwear removing charm? <laughs> no, Stan, don't hit him, not yet. But to indicate the sophistication of which us northerners are capable, <laughs> Café de la Primerie. I wait for you inside a glass beside the long dim window of the Café de la Primerie. I see you beautiful and wry and not yet here and yet not here while this late summer evening never ends and never ends, but is infinitesimally dimming on the street beside Le Al, where I can see you beautiful and wry as you draw near, and I am reassured you are not coming. Yes, all night I wait for you at the Café de la Primerie. Your absence makes you beautiful and wry, and this late summer evening never ends, nor does the beautiful, intolerable music where the truth is cut with sentiment and surely fatal. Come now, do not come. Come now, do not. And lead me to a room where you undress, a bare white room at an untraceable address where we will stay forever. Come now, do not. Yes. And I'll finish with a poem called Mutatis Mutandis. Because I always think, leave him laughing. <laughs> Mutatis Mutandis. The steersman is lost and the hole he has made in the water has swallowed his cry and healed over. The curious fishes must make what they can from his bones, or the great whale may vomit him up on the shore at the feet of a queen who stands waiting and waiting through moon after moon with no news and no rumors but only her sorrow for company. Maritime cities are burned to the waterline. Plague passes north like an army of phantoms by night, and volcanoes roar out from pole to equator while the stones of the world break open and swallow each other and darkness closes over the face of the water and new seas arise from the wreckage of empires and settle and still. At the third stroke, 
The time will be nothing at all, the time of undreaming, when rivers and language are locked in the ice, when the eye and the ear have grown weary of seeing and hearing, the play and the music are over, the desert gives way to the desert, and heaven's high quarrels have found a new venue, the gods never speak of us. We must wake into this poisoned sleep and gather our rag and bone birthright about us and wait until somebody hears herself talking and says it again and somebody beats on a drum with the bone of an auroch and finds that the rhythm becomes an opinion and then with the same bone sketches a line in the sand as the blizzards melt back to the poles and a fire is lit that all men will know of and worship or fear. So many waves of desire, dynasties, fetishes, novel barbarians out of the inexhaustible East. Inquisitors are always on their way, and at one time all this was just fields where the cemeteries grow from the bones of the infantry, forests of marble in which we may seek after wisdom, pursuing the fugitive spirit of things as it slips through the silent ranks of those King Death conscripted for a host the like of which has not been seen by men or gods, and in whose vanguard, goddess, both you and I must ride with fire and sword, because it must be so. The ocean and the mountain and the fire at the core demand it. Why else do we lay siege once more to Troy or Carthage or whatever this place will be called? Thank you.